important. Uh, do you mind being recorded for this? No, we don't. Oh, Please do. I will actually <laughs> get this a little closer to you since my voice is caught a little, a little too well mm -hmm. on that device, so I don't so want to have to worry about clipping. So we need to talk loud. <laughs> Well, uh, oh yeah, I should introduce myself. I'm Giles Edwards, and I'm with uh, 366 Weird Movies, and I'm covering Fantasia for the whole thing, and was very pleased to be able to make it to Vesper last evening, and even happier to see that it was a, a full house from what I observed, so. Yes, a, we uh, also were very happy. Yeah, uh, good. Uh, North American kickoff, right? That was yes, the premiere there yesterday. So that uh, that was a very enjoyable for me, and a uh, I wasn't seen when I raised my hand for the Q and A after. So I'm gonna kick things off with the main question that I had about your film Vesper. Uh, but just before that, so uh, people who are listening to this. Well, know who I'm talking to. If you might say your names again and uh, your, you know, what you were in the film, co-directors or. Co yes. So. Uh, My name is Bruno Samper. Bruno Samper. Uh, and uh, Christina Boisite. And I'm Christina Boisite. Yeah, we are uh, co-directors. Uh, co-writer. And co-writer. And you. And I'm also producer. <laughs> <laughs> and you've worked together before. Certainly in Vanishing Waves. Yes, so we co created Vanishing Waves and we co wrote uh, my first feature, Collectress. The Collectress, huh? Yes, and we also co directed and co wrote and co produced uh, a, C, uh, a segment for ABC Subject. Right, that ABC Subject 2. Yes. Uh, so you are Lithuanian, mm -hmm. you are French. How did you two uh, met? Meet yeah. <laughs> in on international uh, background. Yeah. we met in Prague oh. during a workshop in uh, 2004. Um, it was a workshop in Prague about uh, interactive uh, storytelling. Hmm? You know, or, or you try to think storytelling in the age of uh, interactivity and multimedia. And uh, so we met. We met there and. Uh, and we try to create interactive uh, story tell the uh, stories uh, that uh, interact with audience on like emotional level, sense level, and also uh, how to say mental level. Yeah, we, we have this background from uh, multimedia, interactivity, and, um, and 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 what we take from that and what we bring also in movies is uh, a wheel of uh, immersion to create immersivity mm. and uh, we know you know when when you work on with interactivity finally we, you design experience you create you try to think like uh, or you design an experience a full experience and, mm. uh, it, it's, it, and it's this approach also we we try to bring in movies in fact to really to create an experience and, uh, yes there were a lot of uh, comments and uh, questions certainly about the um, thoroughness of the world and its environment that uh, you two and your team created for Vesper. My question actually pertained to the title, which obviously is the name of the main character, the, uh, the uh, bioscientist wunderkind uh, girl there. And you know, she has her, her father with his um, circumstances. But uh, Vesper is, to me, very closely tied with uh, a time for a time of day for monastic prayer. It's uh, the, the Vespers phenomenon in monasteries in you know yes. Eastern Orthodox, Catholic, even Anglican, I believe, uh, maintained that when they had their split, and that suggested to me there was a very specific reason or reasons behind choosing that name, which I believe translates into evening or yeah. uh, yes, evening along those mass, lines. Evening, uh, evening, evening mass, evening yeah. uh, Because I mean, I mean for, for, for the title, when we search for title, we like uh, that uh, the title would have some hidden meanings mm -hmm. or like uh, several meanings. Uh, so I mean, uh, 
and to, and to, that's where it was from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, because the, the, this world, uh, this the, we set up this world in the age when finally it's the evening of the humanity, it's the evening of uh, of civilization, and uh, so they, they yeah, so with this kind of melancholy, you know, and uh, and wanted the name of the character reflect that. So as uh, the pertaining more to the Latin meaning of the word, not necessarily any tie-in with uh, the religious overtones that uh, might be associated with that. Okay, yeah, I was kind of curious because it's a very uh, memorable title, striking, and um, I say obvious not so much to say, well, duh, but in a kind of uh, chosen, as you say, with a mm -hmm. particular meaning to have that suggestion. And uh, yeah, I like that you mentioned, yes, Evening of Civilization, you commented in, I believe, the introduction to the film yesterday about the tremendous wave of hope that you two were able to enjoy, as it were, you know, two decades ago with mm -hmm. the uh, new millennium and uh, things having progressed more adversely than perhaps we might have hoped in that interim. Uh, as a project, when did you conceive of Vesper? When did this um, dark but ultimately hopeful vision uh, start taking hold as a story you wanted to tell? Well, we started to work at the project, what, six years ago? So it took us uh, a while to develop uh, a script and all like uh, pre-production kicked in uh, like three years ago like uh, and, and the peak was during COVID um, um, but also like already like in writing the script uh, we already came uh, started to think uh, straight how this visual universe will mm -hmm. be because um, I mean uh, when you write such kind of uh, stories it's very important also to already keep in mind the budget and mm -hmm. the restrictions and what it is possible to achieve um, because uh, it's 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 uh, no secret that movie business uh, to make movies it's very expensive mm -hmm. and to make such kind of movies you need to be also g very creative but also very very grounded already from first uh, word on uh, on the paper. No, and we we are fascinated by um, the biodiversity and we wanted to to create also a movie would take place in the nature the nature and uh, then we could develop all this um, all this uh, fun and flora, flora mm -hmm. fauna and uh, you know all these uh, creatures really to um, yes to, to 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 make a movie within a forest we wanted to make also a fairy tale mm -hmm. and uh, wanted really to make a story with really simple um, on surface on surface <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah um, um, very very uh, linear clear but like a tale like you know, little, uh, little red hood, yeah, red, yeah, you know, little red riding hood, yeah, or Snow White, or you know, to have a really uh, this um, this uh, story, we could have this um, quality of a fairy tale, you know, and yeah. uh, so with all finally the code also of the fairy tale, you have uh, Jonas, the uncle is a ogre, yeah, you know, uh, you have the forest, you have the little house, you have. Uh, yeah, the dark cave. Yeah, you you got, got, uh, the, the princess. Yeah. <laughs> the princess come from the city. Yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, definitely. Uh, I can see that, and also uh, I heard you when you mentioned uh, your influences. You know, among them, uh, you mentioned Jim Henson, which um, I felt very much shown through. Uh, I sometime a year or so ago, whenever it came on Netflix, the uh, Dark Crystal. Yeah prequel mm -hmm. and uh, I very much got a vibe of that just sort of everything is alive in a very palpable mm -hmm. kind of way you know sure it's like most places oh there's some tree grass etc but this it's uh, it's all moving exactly. and has a has a sentience to it that one doesn't typically see which uh, I guess probably ties in nicely with your fairy tale ambitions there with um, not just the story and characters alive, but the Close environment the there. Uh, that must have been a one of the creative challenges constrained by budget uh, for the sake of people listening to 
this interview, uh, could you explain a little how you were able to achieve so much thoroughness in the ambiance with, you know, pretty much every patch we're walking through, <coughs> something is coming alive around uh, mm -hmm. Vesper and her friends. Well, at the same time, as you stated just now, and the awareness being there that this is not, you know, a mega budget, you know, James Cameron, let's drop, you know, a third of a billion dollars on. Yes, this. exactly. I mean, the secret, uh, first of course, it is uh, the goal, what you want to achieve, and uh, then it is preparation. And uh, <clears throat> we really, really prepared the. Um, so roughly for, for, for the movie. So we storyboarded uh, all the movie because um, I mean when you work uh, with uh, special effects and after visual effects. So I mean uh, we could and when you have budget restrictions uh, you need to be very very precise. So you, you should plan as much as possible to have uh, um, the sites where you shoot, uh, the number of shots <laughs> to what uh, like camera movement that um, later uh, if uh, I mean yeah that, that later all these uh, elements go in one and the universe gets alive and um, yeah we, we didn't have so much assets so yeah when we was doing scouting or scouting was preparing say, okay well, we can put um, a plant a creature here here we try to optimize the maximum mm -hmm. possible it's a it's a composition, you know, like yeah. when you compose a photography of a frame, you put your element at some strategic place for they have the maximum impact mm -hmm. and uh, when you can see the, the maximum. Also, we were going to some simplicity also. Um, uh, when I say simplicity, then uh, for, for the creatures, they say it's alive, trying what it gives the sensation to be alive. So there is basically two movements, there is breathing movement, breathing and pulsating movement. Mm -hmm. So who was creating some very simple uh, system and device when we could have uh, things we could uh, breathe, you know, or could pulsate and um, like that, in fact, you don't need very complex uh, movement and animation, you know, right. but just with that and it's not very expensive and uh, you, you can give really sensation of, uh, of something living. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, subtle organic touches. Yes. <clears throat> um, to go more toward the uh, I would say science fiction, some of the technology that uh, is explored in Vesper. I was, uh, as I imagine you intended, quite um, happily amused by the father character and uh, his um, means of interaction. I was curious if there was uh, any either fairy tale or more contemporary inspiration for the idea of the kind of uh, floating guiding a head that uh, <laughs> is almost, you know, he's, he's, he's with his daughter a whole lot throughout the movie as this um, other voice for her. I was curious as to what... Uh, yeah, there was many, many inspiration from it. It go from uh, the black hole, Disney, uh, the Disney black hole in the 80s. Oh. Was to robot, <laughs> uh, to uh, even the flubber with uh, Robin William oh, okay. and uh, with, uh, <laughs> uh, for example it was um, uh, it was a t uh, TV serial also in um, in the 80s I forget the name uh, with a guy an alien come from another planet and he have uh, and he have some kind of uh, floating creatures around mm -hmm. him like that very organic also with uh, um, so it was also an animation, Japanese animation called Captain Flam. Captain Flam. I, I don't know. Captain Flam. I don't know the ta English title, but no. uh, anyway. No, no. Uh, so you, you know, it's. Um, I, I mean, there was a lot of um, uh, like these movies or animation or comics or when when they with this kind of uh, of, of character. Yeah, because yeah, he was. Uh, it was a great touch and added uh, both to the science fiction feel of the thing, but also uh, the fairy tale feel of the thing as a, a, a sort of um, sprite or uh, otherwise spirit that's just mm -hmm. gently bobbing around. 
Yeah. It's like a, a kind of a, a voice in the main character's head, yeah. a, a moral voice who who is like putting her back on a trail. Yeah, <laughs> if, if, if if she, you know, it's also like a, a teenage who wants to get free and who wants to become independent, but there is still a voice <laughs> of a parent who says, ah. Uh, see about your values, what you do, and etc. So it was like uh, a bit of almost inner conflict uh, metaphor. It's like a Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, that's. And, but yeah, great touch. And the other one, the. Uh, I'm not sure if I quite got the term, the jerg, the, yeah. the um, artificial creatures yeah. uh, were. I guess in. I'm not sure how to phrase this. They seemed unexpected to me. I wasn't, you know, going into it even at the point where we're first introduced to the phenomenon in the uh, whatever construction accident in the center of town there. And you see this helpless white thing pinned to the ground. Was there a particular uh, motive, uh, inspiration for, for these um, subservient entities? Because um, I can see how they sort of fit into the social structure within the movie because you have the citadels with whatever's going on there and I thought it was a bit of a tease that we never saw what was going on in there. Uh, then you have these villagers and then you have these jerg and below even them you have these uh, pilgrims wandering the landscape and all fitting together. Uh, where did the jerk come from? Because that's like a really big thing in this story you're telling and obviously has ramifications that predate whatever, you know, the snapshot we're seeing of this world. What uh, would you be able to talk about their inception as like a concept, as an underpinning for this uh, milieu and society that we're watching here? If that's... Um. <coughs> I mean, in the jacksuit, it, it, they came very naturally about um, from the point of uh, view of world building. Because uh, in, in, in this world, uh, the citadels, uh, they are very genetically advanced mm -hmm. and uh, they try to preserve control and uh, to shed from outer world. But uh, I mean, we imagine that anyway, people who like um, live there, who close themselves there, so they anyway need uh, help and they need a uh, workforce that uh, do things for them and keep uh, keep the system and everything and as uh, they are very advanced in genetic uh, genetic engineering so i mean it's it's uh, a natural outcome to create a service to create service that uh, you can control mm. because like uh, real humans it's it's very hard to control yeah you have some hard headed um Characters, as uh, yeah. obviously evidenced by Vesper, and uh, well, they, they, they are like robots. But uh, the, the the technology, we are. It's what we, we want to tell also through Vesper. That we are persuaded that more the technology we evolve, will um, will advance, more it will go to the biologic and the organic. Mm -hmm. And uh, we think that today the com computer silicium uh, technology, electronic technology, it's. Uh, it's a transition and more it will complexify more we will go because we try to imitate human technology try to imitate what it exists uh, in the nature right. what the living is doing and more we go more we complexify uh, the sign more we we go more in complexity more we go close of the organic so we think at some point computer will be totally organic I mean, yeah. uh, why not to develop computer with neurons, right? Yeah. And, uh, and um, so, so if we go in this logic, uh, robot will be at some point organic, will be developed genetically. And, yeah, uh, which, yeah, which I guess, uh, yeah, also nicely underscores that the technology that uh, Vesper's father has is rather old at this point, being yes. uh, largely mechanical with. Uh, the bioorganic yeah. bio yeah, uh, organic. <laughs> oh yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Seeing, seeing the inside of his floating head was uh, it's a real a, that, That's why it's a middle. Uh, the, the drone, it's uh, all technology in this world. Yeah. So that's why it's a mix. It's already a technology of transition. It's not fully organic. Yeah. Yeah, it's not fully mechanic. 
and it's a, it's a transition. That's why it's, a, it's an old drone. We imagine in this world it's a drone, we have a, maybe 100 years or something oh. like that. I guess, in, in a way, fingers are crossed um, for that. Uh, now, you two have obviously worked together for a while. I'm going to guess uh, you probably, hopefully, have plans to continue so doing. Uh, even beyond uh, future films within the world of Vesper, which uh, I know much of the audience was hopeful about, do you uh, have any projects either in that vein or in uh, other paths you plan to explore coming in the near future? Yes, yes, we do. I mean, uh, <laughs> well, at least well, once you can talk about anyway. We, we somehow, I mean, our goal and our aim is to create wealth. Mm -hmm. We like to create wealth, and we are very curious in, the, in like uh, the surprises of uh, not surprises. This uh, uh, the wealth of, uh, constructed by genetic engineering, mm -hmm. and where you can push push that. So beside. Uh, Best per sequel <laughs> that we imagine we would concentrate on adventure, mm -hmm. on like action to go out into the world. Because when we created this world, we were very like we wanted to make it bigger. Mm -hmm. We wanted to, that uh, this world, when audience watch, it's it exists b behind the story. Yeah. Yes, and uh, like uh, it's not like uh, all the um, elements are explained or like you know all elements uh, have uh, like a payoff but we wanted to people to believe in this well mm -hmm. so now i mean uh, if, if if to work on the second uh, part uh, we would like to go out and already to to reveal more of the world mm -hmm. of, of vesper and yes I, I, and i we think that uh, adventure it would be very very good uh, approach and for the next stories, uh, you can you can say you no. Know? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yeah. We um, uh, on Vespa we wanted to concentrate on the character, to set up the character, but to introduce a little bit the world. And if we have the possibility to make a sequel, yeah. Well, now now the character is uh, is already uh, mm -hmm. introduced. So now would like uh, to yeah to, to go to explore this world. And, uh, <laughs> I hope that I do. I, I sincerely hope that works out. Uh, my time is running out here, but I do like to close my interviews with this uh, particular question for each of you. Uh, would you care to tell us your hometown and if you can recommend a restaurant there? <laughs> and this can be adopted hometown or whatever you feel is a home place for you. Restaurant in Vilnius? <laughs> yes, restaurant in Vilnius. <laughs> now we try. I mean, in Vilnius there are really a lot, a lot of places and very, very nice places. So it's very hard to choose like one. And uh, now I, I, I don't manage to remember the name, but we have very good French restaurant. <laughs> and of course we have wonderful, like um, uh, Lithuanian kind of middle age restaurant mm -hmm. with. Uh, while beer, uh, how is it? Not beer, but uh, boar. No, yeah. <laughs> wild boar. boar. Yeah, wild, wild, boar. Boar. Ah. wild boar, and you know a bit uh, like uh, wild animal meat. So I mean, uh, this uh, would be, uh, and it's called uh, lokis, a uh, beer. Uh, so I mean, yeah, it's like uh, very um, invitable. <laughs> you were <know what>, uh? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in Montpellier, in Montpellier, it was, uh, bah, le, we have uh, we have a very famous uh, twin cook mm. uh, called Les Frères Porcel, and uh, there is a uh, Jardin d'Essence uh, restaurant, and uh, it's really something. Mm. <laughs> well, that's excellent. Well, thank very you. unexpected question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you both very much, uh, Thanks, not Jim. only for your time Thanks. today, but also for having crafted such an enjoyable, um, atmospheric, fleshed out movie for myself and uh, the many people who were able to enjoy it yesterday and in the future. So I wish you both the very best of luck with whatever projects are coming ahead for you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much.